The first title I thought of giving this lecture was The Influence of Dante on My Work, which is really what this lecture is about. How Dante is still influencing a sculptor in the 21st century. And then, the more I wrote about Dante, and the more I was finding what united the Divine Comedy with my sculptures, the more an association of words came to my mind that defines both his aesthetic in the 14th century and my aesthetic in the 21st century. <clears throat> this association of words is transcendental aesthetic. So I will call this lecture Essay on Transcendental Aesthetic. Transcendental meaning what is spiritual and what belongs to the non-physical or the superphysical dimension of life and aesthetic, of course, being the theory of art. I interpret Dante's work from two point of view. The point of view of philosophy of religion and the point of view of sculpture. I read Dante with the eyes of a sculptor. Man is at the center of my research. The study of man is at the center of sculpture since millenniums. So when I open the Divine Comedy, what inspires me the most is to see inside the structure of the poem the structure of man. I am a sculptor of the human figure, and Dante's poem is crowded with human figures. All the circles of the Divine Comedy are landscapes of the human figures or souls, and to each soul Dante attaches a passion or virtue. So not only you have bodies walking in hell or ascending in paradise, but you also have a description of what is happening in the brain of these bodies. For a sculptor, this is visually extremely inspiring because that is what we do. We create bodies and then we put a brain in the clay inside the statue through the expression of the figure. Dante's bodies talk, the answer to Dante and Virgil. The bodies created by a sculptor do not talk, but we make them talk by the way we articulate the different segments of the body. If you sculpt the rib cage aiming towards the left and the pelvis aiming towards the right, you are going to show a contradicted soul. If you sculpt a rib cage that is standing up towards the sun, you are going to give a feeling of unity with the world. And on the reverse, if the rib cage arches down, you are going to convey a feeling of internality, introspection, and uneasiness with the world. And it is by multiplicating this formula ad infinitum that we create more or less complex and philosophical sculptures. That is why I don't call my sculpture statues, but I call them philosophical mannequins. So when I open the Divine Comedy, I see a forest of sculptures, a little bit like the vision of petrified souls in the Neoplatonic heaven. Dante is a sculptor in that way, and that is the reason why some of the most iconic statues ever created were made by Viceral, Dante's reader, the gate of hell and the thinker of Rodin, and the prisoners of Michelangelo were made by two passionate Dante's readers. In this extraordinary ability that Dante has to describe the unreal, I find as an artist that there is one danger in contemplating it too close. And this danger is illustration. There is a difference between illustration and creation. The Divine Comedy has inspired some of the most striking illustration ever made, and I will just mention Gustave Doré and William Blake. But this is not my approach. I do not read the book to transfer a written image into a three-dimensional image directly. This does not interest me. I am not an illustrator, but a sculptor. I am inspired by Dante, but I want to create images that are mine. To do that, instead of putting a mirror on the text, I am admiring his approach of art. That way I can approach my own times with his mind without repeating what he sees. So my way of creating with Dante goes through my admiration of the mechanism of his creation. Where I follow him very closely is when art and theology are completely integrated in, in the same mind and I follow the same creative process in the sense that I create at the rhythm of my revelations. As a sculptor, it is totally insignificant to me to just represent the human figure for the sake of representation. I need to understand something about the riddle of life to be able to be inspired and create something. There is no separation in my art between the act of approaching the sacred and the act of creating. For me, the goal of a sculptor 
is to ensoul art with transcendence. What I adore about the Divine Comedy is the concept of philosophical geometry or spiritual mathematics. Let's state this briefly. We have three parts of the poem, and each part is divided by 33 to 34 kanti. Okay, that seems like a lot of threes to me. That is when I step back and I wonder in awe if the structure of the Divine Comedy is not a symbol of the structure of man. The idea of metaphysical numbers at the time of Dante is not a new idea. For Pythagoras, the number three was a sacred number. When you read Greek philosophy, you often read a description of man in three parts. It was so important in the Greek world that we sometimes wonder if the division of Christianity between hell, purgatory, and paradise is not an extension of a Greek belief. This is one of the concepts that inspires me the most in my sculpture and in my relation to Dante. And this concept is the idea of anatomical philosophy or mystical anatomy. In Greek philosophy, there is often the idea that the human body is divided in three segments. First, you have the inferior world, which is the pelvic cavity. Second, you have the supreme world, which is the ribcage cavity. And third, you have the superior world, which is the cranial cavity. And to connect the three cavities together, you have the cerebrospinal system, which is an extension of the brain through the body through the spinal cord. So the pelvic cavity is where all the passions are. That would be Dante's hell. The ribcage cavity is where the heart works to reconcile the inferior world with the superior world. That would be purgatory. And then the cranial cavity is the superior world, the mind that controls the rest of the body, and that would be the paradise. Man, therefore, would have a theological structure in his body. That is the nucleus of my fascination for Dante, the idea that the Divine Comedy is about the mystical anatomy of man. Of course, here we are into crypto-religious considerations, pseudoscience and mysticism. But after all, with Dante, we are dealing with theology and poetry, the two most subjective human activity on earth. Like says Feuerbach in the essence of Christianity, religion is subjective by nature and not objective. I have not seen a frog resurrecting so far, so religion is not in the realm of objectivity. So to carry on in this mysterious logic, we can also imagine that most of the three parts being divided by 33 counties and by applying our sculptural and human analogy, this 33 number is also the number of vertebras in the human body. That starts in the inferior world, the sacrum, and ascends to the superior world uh, through the form and magnum into the round chamber of the mind, which is the superior world. Almost medically, where the mind and the sacred meet. Then, when I open the canto number 22 of Paradise and I read Dante's vision of Jacob's ladder, with the angel going up and down the mystical ladder, then I receive it as the cerebral spinal fluid or neurological nervous impulses that go up and down from the brain to give order to the other level of the body. You imagine how this vision of man is such a joy for a sculptor because it is exactly what I do when I sculpt. I start by sculpting the pelvic cavity, then the spine, and I articulate the ribcage cavity and the cranial cavity around that metaphysical staircase that we call the spine. By elaborating the structure of man as a theological structure, it gives me my mission as a sculptor, which is as follows. When I study the human figure, I do much more than just doing a perfect rendition of man. I am dissecting the mysteries of existence. Through the prism of Dante and with the eyes of the sculptor, man becomes a theological laboratory. This metaphysical mathematics, divided in three, works for statues that are still but then you add movement to this sacred structure and then you can start elaborating three-dimensional philosophy. I always said a good sculpture is a philosophical or theological system that you can touch. When I look at the map of the purgatory, I feel I am in front of a perfect example of metaphysical geometry. This is very interesting to me because this is exactly how I start a statue. I create a symbolic geometry with an armature in iron and then I build a figure around it. The way Dante creates a map of his thoughts is exactly how I design my sculptures. 
To conclude on mystical anatomy, I will say that this is the greatness of the Divine Comedy and what inspires me the most is that the Divine Comedy works in a theological way but also in a secular way which make Dante our contemporary. By making the structure of the Divine Comedy the structure of man, Dante tells us that there is a possible imminent dimension of what is eternal. Religions pass and man remains, then why not creating directly a theology of man? In my interpretation of the Divine Comedy, this thought seems embryonic in this great book. So through Dante, and always with Dante, I sculpt, because I'll also share his aesthetic. My interpretation of Dante's aesthetic is as follows. I believe, like him, that the sublime happens in a work of art when there is a combination of the unreal with the real. Dante portrays people walking in the afterlife, talking and asking questions to people in the great beyond. We can difficultly show something more unreal than that. And yet, he described this just like if he was doing a painting of a conversation in a naturalistic novel. I believe it is not possible to know Dante by knowing only everything about him. You have to make a detour through the 19th century to understand him to the fullest. Dante dominated culturally the 19th century. And I will briefly introduce two French writers that helped me conceptualize more the aesthetic of the high middle age in the contemporary world, and these are Josepha Péladin and Carl Joris Huismans, two writers and art critics art, uh, active in Paris at the end of the 19th century. Josepha Péladin wrote a book about Dante called The Doctrine of Dante, and he tried to revive the secret society that Dante was supposedly in. His masterpiece is a book called Mystical and Idealistic Art, published in 1909. With the Divine Comedy, this is my other Bible as a sculptor. The book gives the most beautiful definition of art ever written, in my opinion, and it applies beautifully to Dante. Josephine Peladon writes, art should give us a transcendental spasm. There is in this phrase most of what I think about the aesthetic of the Divine Comedy. I will call this aesthetic a transcendental aesthetic, in a sense that the union of art with a superior explanation of existence is one thing in Dante's creation. The study of the sacred and art are one, and just like Dante was taking the hand of Virgil, as a sculptor, I take the hand of Dante to walk through the limbos of contemporary aesthetics, and by walking with him, he's showing me that art is transcendental or it is not art. I fully apply the theory in the 21st century through my sculptures. Each of my sculptures, whether it relates to Dante or not, is a different circle in my approach of the sacred. Josephine Peladon likes to use a word called terrestrialization. And what it means is that Dante's art is in fleshing transcendence into the real. So that the highest energies of life that we call God live around us in our daily lives. The second author who helped me understand the aesthetic of Dante and my own aesthetic is Carl Joris Wismans. He built his art theory through the analysis of the most famous triptych of the late Middle Age, this painting called The Outer Piece of Isenheim, painted by Matthias Grunwald. The painting is of a very high pictorial realism and shows the highest mysticism, basically it is a painting of the unseen, painted like if the unseen was an object visible. The effect that it produces on the brain of the viewer is the impression of walking in the middle of the fantastic and to be surrounded by theological sublimities in daily life. He called this aesthetic mystical realism. Dante's aesthetic is very strong because he realizes the fusion of transcendence and immanence. He achieves the dream of Pythagoras, who defines beauty as the reconciliation of the opposites. And the more opposites the pole are, the more sublime it is. I think that definition is great to characterize Dante's aesthetic, and I do follow in all of my sculptures the code of mystical reality. 
If I want my work to have a Dantesque feeling, I have to modernize the text. I am not going to create a statue in the 21st century with the theology of the 14th century. It would be anachronistic and disconnected. When you study philosophy of religion in the 21st century, you cannot ignore the new concepts that have emerged through time, like atheism, nihilism, and atheology. Dante was absolutely unaware of this concept, except atheism that he places in the first circle of hell as the non-believers or the heretics. But I wonder sometimes, if Dante would have been born in the 21st century, if he would have thought about nihilism, and I wonder in what circle he would have placed the nihilist. If I want to follow Dante as an artist in the 21st century, I have to integrate all of these new concepts to my work, even if they are sometimes opposite to his system, because they are theological problems of our age. So by detaching myself from Dante, I get even closer to him because he poeticized the theology of his age. And I'm trying to do the same thing, to connect philosophically with my own age, to find a system of man, if there is any. Because as a sculptor of the human figure, my art depends on it. What is the point of sculpting man if you do not have an idea of man? As I said earlier, I create only by the rhythm of my revelations. If that is true, then creating a theology will help me create more statues. So I created, created a philosophical system to produce more. And the uh, more I develop my personal theology adapted to the 21st century, the more statues are growing around me. The system I created is called sacred nihilism. The definition of sacred nihilism is the marriage of the theism and the sacred. Sacred nihilism is not a defense of nihilism. It is on the contrary fighting nihilism with nihilism itself saying nihilism is not what it seems. It has philosophical degrees that might lead to a vision, a new vision of the sacred. It is just a sacred without religion. It is saying that transcendence exists in the structure of man and does, doesn't need religion to put a label on it. It is precisely because transcendence is in the structure of man that religion is able to appropriate something that already exists in man and not the other way around. If Dante is going to inspire me in the 21st century, I have to use theological concepts uh, of my century to approach him. Uh, if I don't do that, I would only repeat the past and strong creation always integrate the present even if it has its inspiration in the 14th century. We cannot today speak about religion, Dante and art without mentioning uh, Nietzsche's attack on theology. In the 21st century, I feel there is no strong picture of eternity anymore, so through my sculptures, I have, I'm trying to give a sketch of what could be eternity in the 21st century. I am a Hegelian when it comes to history. I believe that systems, theologies, develop into their absolute expression and then they lose their vitality. And they are replaced by other theologies, other systems of man. In other words, when Nietzsche announced the death of God in 1883, I believed him. A lot of concepts have been born since the Divine Comedy has been written, so I will not create another law of St. Thomas Aquinas. Dante had the theological muse. Since then, theology started to crumble in Europe in the 19th century with positivism and new concepts arrived like atheism and nihilism. And we started creating a big separation between religion and atheism in the 20th century, at least in Europe. I find this separation artificial, both on the side of religion and on the side of atheism. So, as I live in the 21st century and not in the 14th century, I have to integrate in my Divine Comedy in Bronze all these new concepts. So, just like Dante was involved into integrating theology in his heart, I am involved into trying to integrate new theologies to my art. And the way I do that is by illustrating the idea that the decline of religions in Europe is not the decline of the sacred. In my art, I try to explore, on the contrary, the link between atheism and the sacred. And just like Dante showed me, I am establishing through each sculpture the different sacred circles of new possible theologies. To fight unilateral nihilism, I am building a post-Nietzschean spirituality through sculpture. Through my sculpture, I am building a nihilist theology. I am fighting nihilism with nihilism itself, but again, a superior and spiritual form of nihilism. 
instead of returning to religion because I believe that the spiritual revolutions are advancing towards always more truth and we cannot go backward with the history of the mind. This is also something that Dante taught me. It is that a word does not have only one definition, but degrees, circles and dimension. Dante created a system of his age, I must try to sketch a system of my age, which means I must integrate my divine comedy and clear the concept of atheology. We have for we had for 2,000 years theology that explained the situation of man with God. We need a, in the arts and philosophy to elaborate the concept of atheology, which is the explanation of man without God. I call for a new Dante to create a divine comedy based on atheology. And even more so, I call for a new Thomas Aquinas to write the Summa Atheologicae. A second divine comedy that would describe the nine circles of nihilism would be a fascinating project. In what circle an imaginary contemporary Dante would have placed Nietzsche? In the ninth circle? Or maybe in a contemporary version of the divine comedy, Nietzsche would have replaced Virgil to guide us towards transcendence. But he would have probably had to stay in the lower circles for having denied God. I am asking Dante's questions through my sculpture with the vocabulary of the 21st century. In other words, is nihilism the new hell? Is sacred nihilism the new purgatory? And is transcendence the new paradise? After all, there are four fast, at least. Why not having two divine comedy? Until then, I will do my part as a sculptor guided by Dante beyond atheism and Christianity. Dante showed us something extremely important we cannot create anything great without a system of life and a system of the afterlife. And by creating a theological system a man of man, he showed us that the sacred can exist with or without religion. One of the most important human revolution in Europe was the separation of the church from the state in 1905. And I think that the next great human revolution will be the separation of the transcendental from religion. That humanization of religion makes Dante a visionary still seven centuries after the creation of the Divine Comedy. Dante reconciles the real and the non-real, the anatomical and the divine, and my aesthetic is trying to reconcile two opposite philosophies, transcendence and materialism, to find a third metaphysical territory. There is a Jewish proverb that says, when you hesitate between two things, Choose the third one. Maybe one day, when I will look back at my body of work, I then will have to give a name to my corpus of statues or to the opus magnum. I might call it then the comedy of secular transcendence. Thank you very much all for listening.